Scripture reading this morning is coming from Psalms chapter 130. Psalms chapter 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I will wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than the watchmen wait for the morning, more than the watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. In the Psalms, we find many prayers from many different men, many different authors of each of these Psalms. But one thing that I find, at least in many of the Psalms, is prayerful persistence. Over and over and over again, the, the, the Psalms, different men in different times, in different opportunities, different circumstances, they pray to God, God, hear my prayer. God, hear from me when, when I call out to you from this situation or that situation or about this topic or about these people. God, hear my prayer. And in the prayer that was just read to us, the psalm that was just read to us, the psalmist again says, hear me when I call out from these depths, when I call out from this bad situation that I'm in. But ultimately, what is the psalmist of Psalm 130 going to do? Rely upon the Lord. The title for this morning's lesson is from our 52-week series, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. And the point that you need to walk away from, that I want to walk away from this lesson is that we need to be prayerfully persistent. We know from Romans chapter 12 and verse 12 where uh, Paul has given the, the Roman church there a, a laundry list, you might say, of things that they need to do, attributes that they need to have in their lives, that, that one of them is they need to be, from Romans 12, 12, devoted to prayer. They need to pray. They need to be devoted to it. They need to be earnest about their prayer. From Acts chapter 1 in the upper room where that 120 or so followers of Jesus are, are gathered together before he ascends or before the day of Pentecost... It says there in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14 that they are devoted to prayer. In Acts chapter 2, after the day of Pentecost, after 3,000 souls are added to that group of about 120, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it says that they are devoted to prayer. God's people, Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, we must be from the very beginning of the church. Christians are to be devoted to prayer. And then we all know 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17 where Paul tells the Thessalonian church, pray without ceasing. Be devoted to prayer. That's what we want to think about this morning. And not just, and maybe the point that I hope that we walk away from is that yes, we need to be persistent, we need to be devoted, we need to pray all the time, but our persistence doesn't just isn't just encapsulated by the times that we spend in prayer, but the reality is that our, our life needs to be a practice of that prayer. That the things that we are praying to God for, that we are living a kind of life that will fall in line with what our prayers are. And that our prayers will fall in the kind of life that God wants us to live. We need to be devoted to prayer. We need to be prayerfully persistent. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. We're going to be flipping back and forth between Luke chapter 11 and Luke chapter 18 this morning. Uh, here, uh, God is, uh, in two different uh, circumstances, Jesus is talking to his apostles about prayer, and he tells two different but very similar stories that I think have at least a very similar application. So we're going to look at both of them, and we're going to flip back and forth kind of in between the, the, the accounts here. But let's look at it, first of all, from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Let's see what's the, the instigator of this conversation that Jesus is going to have with the apostles. It happened that while Jesus was praying, 
in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his apostles. There's a country song, I couldn't remember, I thought about it this morning, I couldn't remember who, who sings it, but it talks about how his son uh, has been watching him, and it says, Dad, I've been watching you, ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo, I want to be like you. And he talks about specifically there how he had just watched his son pray and, and talk to God like he's his friend. But, but the, the point is that Jesus' apostles here are watching Jesus pray. And after they hear him pray, there must be something different about how he prays because they say, Lord, teach us to pray like you pray. Teach us to pray. John, John how his apostles to pray. You teach us how to pray. Now, had, had the apostles been praying their whole life? Yes. Prayer was a, a, a very important part of the, the Jewish lifestyle, the Jewish religion in the Old Testament. They, they prayed all the time. They had specific prayers that they prayed. But there's something different about the way that Jesus prayed. And they, they say, Lord, teach us to pray. In verses 2 through 4, we see what is often referred to as the Lord's Prayer. It's Luke's version of it, Matthew's version of it. His, his account of it is a little bit longer, probably better known, and the one that's uh, repeated more often. Uh, it's not the Lord's Prayer specifically. What is it? It's the answer to the question, Lord, or the request, Lord, teach us to pray. It's, it's a model prayer. And we'll quickly notice four things from it this morning. This will not be the, the main thrust of our lesson. But let's notice quickly four things from verses 2 through 4 of Luke chapter 11. And he, Jesus, said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. Let's notice four things quickly from this. First of all, the presentation. Who are we presenting our prayers to? Father, hallowed be your name. We're praying to our holy God and Father the creator of all things. Who are we presenting our prayers to? Just as a side note, it's, it's something that, that we need to make sure. What is what's one thing that Jesus says that you need to pray for this? Your kingdom come. Well, we know that the church is the kingdom. The church, uh, the, therefore, the, the kingdom has already come. But we could still pray this in a sense. Uh, the scripture tells us, Maranatha, O Lord, come. We, we are eagerly anticipating the, the coming of the Lord, the, the second coming where we can be in the kingdom in heaven with God in its ultimate fruition. So in that way, we can still pray a, a similar but a different meaning. Here, before the day of Pentecost, before the church began, uh, Jesus says, pray for the church, pray for the beginning, pray for uh, the, the faith to be delivered, pray for my kingdom to come. But now we are a part of that kingdom. You are a part of the kingdom of God. But ultimately, we will be in the kingdom with God, uh, in the kingdom with God in heaven. Secondly, notice what else we see here. When we pray, who should we pray to? We should pray to God. Secondly, we should pray for provision. Verse 3, give us each day our daily bread. Now, what is that not saying? God, just give me this, and give me this, and give me all these things, and Lord, I really want this over here, and Lord, I really want these things, and I really want this. What does he say? Give us each day our daily bread. Give us another version or another way to say it. Give us what we need today. Focus on today, and Lord, please allow me to have what I need to today. Verse 4, I think, would be a challenge. Verse 4, you know, maybe the, the apostles, when they hear this part, they say, Really? I've got to pray for that. The first part they like pretty good. Lord, forgive us our debts. That second part, though, is a promise. As we have forgiven those who are indebted to us. God, forgive us as we forgive others. So there's, there's a prayer there, but there's also a promise. There's an application, as there always is with prayer. When we pray to God, we're also telling God, asking God, help, uh, declaring to God, God, I'm going to do this. Notice that that's important, as we forgive those who are indebted to us. And then the last part of this uh, description of the Lord's Prayer, or the model prayer, is we can ask for protection. And lead us not into temptation. So there's four things that you can recognize of, of what you should say when you pray. First of all, who should you present your prayers to? God the Father. Secondly, we should ask for provision. Give us this day our daily bread. We can, ask, we can uh, ask for forgiveness, but also recognize there's a promise there. God, as I am asking you for these things, I'm also promising you that I'm going to live the kind of life that you want me to live. I'm making that promise to you. And fourthly, from these passages,
in this passage, ask for protection. God, lead us not into temptation. That is the, at least in, in Luke's account, the, the what of Lord teach us to pray. But I think the two stories that we're going to find in Luke chapter 11 and Luke chapter 18, which we'll spend the, most, the majority of our time on this morning, is the how of how we ought to pray. Turn over to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, let's read verses 1 through 5. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. Again, this is talking about the, the how, of how of what we should be praying about. He's In Luke chapter 17, Jesus has just finished teaching some, some challenging things, maybe some difficult things for the apostles uh, to hear, talking about some coming difficulties. And then it says in, in verses 1 through 5, again, of Luke 18, Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. Okay, he's just told them some things that might cause them to lose heart. And in order to circumvent that, in order to overcome that, he says, you need to pray all the time so that you won't lose heart. Saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but after, for a while he was unwilling. But afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect men, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming to me, she will wear me out. This is the parable of the unrighteous judge. And here, as it's clearly said, as you learn there, there's a certain city, there's a judge, there's a woman who needs and seemingly has the right to legal protection, but this judge isn't a good man. He doesn't fear God, doesn't believe in God, doesn't respect man, so he just does whatever he wants. What's the only reason that this unrighteous judge gives this woman what she rightly deserves? Because she's persistent. Because she... Annoys him because he says, if I don't do this, she's going to wear me out. Literally, it means going to give me a black eye. And now, whether that means from, from a lack of sleep or he feels like he's getting beat up by her, I, I'm not sure. But he says, this woman's wearing me out. She's, she's getting on my nerves. Let me, just, let me just get rid of this woman. And the only way I'm going to get rid of this woman is by giving her what she wants. This is an unrighteous judge doing the right thing only because... He's annoyed. Only because of the persistence of this woman. In Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 8, a different story with a similar application, I believe. Luke 11, verses 5 through 8, right after the, the model prayer is given. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a, has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. It sounds like an odd request, doesn't it? At midnight, if I show up at your door and I knock on your door and I say, Hey, I need some bread. Three loaves of bread, as a matter of fact. What are you going to say? Probably pr something pretty similar to what this man says, okay? Now, he, he gives him a reason why, verse 6. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, also in the middle of the night, I assume, and, have n and I have nothing to set before him. Verse 7. And from inside, he doesn't even open the door, the friend. From inside, he says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. What does he say? Leave me alone. I'm sleeping. What are you doing? Don't you know what time it is? Why are you knocking on my door at midnight for bread? That doesn't make any sense. What's the application? Verse 8, Jesus says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. He says, this man is not going to do anything for his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Why is the, the man who's asleep and his family's asleep, why does he get up at midnight? Not because he's this man's friend. Because he wants to go back to sleep. Because this, this friend is persistent. What do we see there? Maybe he, he's knocking and, and the, the friend says, he doesn't answer and he knocks some more and he still doesn't answer and he knocks some more and he says, what, what, what do you need? What, what's wrong? What, why are you bothering me? He says, I need some bread. I've got, I've got a guest and I need to be able to, to sit something before them. You need bread? I know, I know they didn't have grocery stores, but it, that's what we would say, right? Go to the grocery store. Leave me alone. He says, I, I'm asleep. The door is shut. It's, it's not proper for you to be knocking on my door at midnight asking me for bread. I, I'm, we're not that close of friends. Maybe it's what he says. 
Yet because of his persistence, because he keeps on knocking, why didn't he go to somebody else's door? I don't know, but he didn't. He stayed at this friend's door, and because of his persistence, the man gets up out of bed, goes and gets the bread, and takes it to him. Because of his persistence. Now this is a friend, but it isn't because he's a friend that he gives him the bread. It's because, again, of his persistence. There's an unrighteous judge that does the right thing because of persistence. There's a reluctant friend who does the right thing, not because of friendship, but because of persistence. Again, in the Luke 18 account, the, the unrighteous judge says, the only reason I'm going to do this is because this woman will wear me out. The only reason that the man gets up and gives him the bread is because he, he wants to go back to sleep, because the man is persistent. Look to Luke chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. After telling us that story about this unreluctant friend, it says in verse 9, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. The Greek here has this idea of an, an ongoing. And when, when it says there uh, in verse 9, so I say to you, ask, it, it literally can mean keep asking, and it will be given to you. When it says seek, it means keep seeking, and you'll find. When it says knock, it means keep knocking, and it will be open to you. What, what's it mean there? Be persistent over and over and over again. Ask and seek and find and pray and do the things that you ought to do along those lines. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep praying. And then in Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13, and also in Luke chapter 18, we, we find another application that Jesus says about the unreluctant friend versus God and the unrighteous judge versus God. Look what it says in verses 11 through 13. Now suppose one of you one of your fathers is, excuse me, now suppose one of you fathers is asking, is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? Verse 13, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He just talked about an unreluctant friend, and the only reason that unreluctant friend gives anything is because of persistence. Then he gives a, an example of if you're a father and your, your uh, child asks you for some food, you're not going to not give him food, right? If he asks for a fish, you're not going to give him a, a snake, or you're, if he asks for an egg, you're not going to give him a scorpion. And, and we say, Jesus, what, what kind of example is that? That's ridiculous. That doesn't even make any sense, Jesus. And that, that's the point that he's making to his apostles. And he says, if, if you then, evil people know how to give good gifts, God is good. And He will do right. And He will care for us. And He will do the right thing. Look to, over to Luke chapter 18. Let's look at verses 6 through 8. Uh, again, a similar, similar story here. Two different circumstances, but, but similar stories. Verse 6, he says, And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. He says, Why did the unrighteous judge do the right thing? Only because of persistence. Verse 7, Now, will not God be, bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night, and, he will de, and will he delay any longer over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? What's he saying there? The unrighteous judge does the right thing eventually. And he's an unrighteous judge. He doesn't, he doesn't know God. He doesn't love God. He doesn't care about God. He, he doesn't even like people that much. He doesn't respect people, but he does the right thing because of persistence. And as we learn about, Lord, teach us to pray. We need to pray to the right person. We need to ask for the right things. But we also need to be persistent in our prayers. And we need to keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Now here's prayerful persistence. Pray without ceasing. Be devoted to prayer. Do we need to, to pray for things that we want or think that we need or think it will be a good idea more than once? Yeah. We need to be persistent in our prayer life. If there's something that you have put the time and energy and effort and thought into and you think this is really what I need in my life, this is what God would, would want in my life, we need to keep asking God. That's, that's a lesson we can take from this. 
But what else is a lesson that we can take from this? Not, not only in our prayer life, there's also an application to prayer. When we ask God for forgiveness, we also say, God, I will forgive those who have sinned against me. When we, when we ask, we need to seek. We need to live a life that is, will fit into what we're asking God to give us. We need to knock. We need to look for opportunities to do the things that we are asking for God to place into our lives. Our lives have to change with our prayers. Listen, have you ever prayed for God to help you be more faithful? I have. Does that just happen? I'm more faithful. No. I've got I've to practice that, right? I've got to put into practice what I want God to give me. And listen, God answers prayers. And, and when we think about prayer, sometimes, you know, we, and I, I say this sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm praying for you, and if there's anything more I can do, let me know. That's true. I want to I do more than just pray for people that are sick or pray for people that are going through difficult times. But the greatest thing that you and I can ever do is pray because we're praying to a God who answers prayers, who's the creator of the universe, who's more powerful than any of us and all of us combined. Prayer is a powerful thing, and, and God answers prayer. But I still have to make a change in my life. I still have to be persistent. And in, 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 if I'm asking God for something, I need to prepare myself for when God gives it to me. I need to have the faith that God will deliver that answer to me and to be prepared for when he does. We need to be persistent in our prayers and persistent in the way that God would have us to live. God is good. That's the point of Luke 11 verses 11 through 13 and, at, and Luke 18 verses 6 through 8 is, is this, this unrighteous judge, this unwilling friend, this, this father who would give the right thing to his, his children. All of you are sinners. All of you are evil. All of you have things in your life that, that you're not good. But God is good. God desires for good things to happen to each and every one of us. Ultimately for salvation to happen to each and every one of us. In Luke chapter 18, it goes on in verses 10 and following. It tells us a, another familiar parable. We're not going to take the time to read it. I think that you're all probably pretty familiar with it. But it's the prayers. Uh, it says Jesus sees, actually. Uh, looks and, and, and sees two men praying. He sees a Pharisee and he sees a publican or a tax collector. And the Pharisee comes and he, he thanks God. God, thank you that I'm not like other people. Thank you that I'm not like these, this, this sinner over here, that sinner over there, this sinner over here, that sinner over here. And he even looks at the tax collector. And I'm not like this tax collector. I do all of these things. I, I, I follow you and I'm, I'm your great servant, God. Thank you for allowing me to be your great servant. And then he says of the tax collector, he's so distraught with his life that he won't even lift his eyes up to heaven. He bows his head, he beats his chest, and he says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Humility in prayer is essential. When we come before God, we must have the attitude that Jesus described in Luke chapter 22 and verse 42 as he prays to his Father, not my will, but thy will be done. When we think about prayer and we think about our lives God answers the prayer of the faithful. And part of that is because the faithful are striving to be who God wants him to be, him or her to be. When we pray to God to help us to be more like his son, when we pray to God to give us the things that we need, and when we seek his will, he will give us those things. Does that mean that we always get what we pray for? I think it was talked about in, in class this morning here in the auditorium. I'm not sure. I heard a little bit about it uh, between classes. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, Paul prays to the Lord three times. He's persistent. Lord, remove this thorn in the flesh, this temptation from me. What's God's answer? No. Nope. I'm not going to remove it. My grace is sufficient for you. Sometimes God's answers, even to our persistent prayers, is no. So, so what do we do with that? We recognize that that's not God's will, and we accept those things, and we move on. When we think about, Lord, teach us to pray, we need to think about who we present our prayers to, what we pray, which we can learn from that model prayer that Jesus gives us, which we can learn from all of Scripture. But another application that I, that I want you to take with you this morning, that I want to take with myself this morning, is that I can't expect God to answer 
just a prayer. An example of that is in, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. It says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. We see in Acts chapter 22, Paul um, retelling his, his conversion story. You remember Saul as he's on the road to Damascus. What happens? A great light shines. He's struck blind, and then he goes into the city. For three days he's there. What do you think Paul's doing for three days? Imagine he's praying. Imagine he's spending great amounts of time praying. But what happens? He has to, to act when, when, he's, when the, the, the preacher comes to him and tells him, what do you, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized. Call on the name of the Lord. There, there's, that's just an example of an action that must take place with our prayer life. When we want God to act in our lives, we absolutely must pray, but we must also act. I've heard it said this way. We need to pray like it all depends on God, and we need to work like it all depends on us. There must be action in our life that matches our desires and our prayers, and the desires of our prayers must be according to the will of God. There are people who believe incorrectly that we can just pray and that God's going to take care of everything. That's not the way it works. We have a responsibility, an obligation, and a duty to act out, even on our prayer life, even on the things that we want God to do in our lives. So as we think about that, as you think about that in your life as an individual, as we think about that as our families, as we think about that as a congregation, what are the things that we want God to use us for? Let's pray about it. Let's be persistent about it. But then in doing so, let's prepare and put into action the things that we know that we ought to do so that we can accomplish the things and God can use us to accomplish the things that we are praying about. Prayer is powerful because God is powerful. If you need the prayers of the church this morning, you have that opportunity now. If you want to come forward here in just a few minutes and, and ask for our prayers, we'll pray and God will work and God will accomplish much in your life. Be persistent in your prayers and be persistent in your application of God's word in your life so that he can answer those prayers for you. If you have any needs, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing. Jesus alone.